Uh, I'm Kasim. I am Associate Prof and Director of Enterprise at uh, Northumbria University. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, macro BIM adoption. What I mean by macro BIM adoption is uh, BIM adoption at market-wide level. So I'm not looking at the single organization, I'm looking at the market-wide level. However, what I am presenting in terms of models, you could, most of them you could apply or use them as well at organization level. Uh, what I will, uh, uh, I have five models for the, to, to describe macro BIM adoption. I will focus on the one adopted by uh, the uh, uh, by the initiative here. Uh, but before before moving to that part, I will try I will try just a few slides of introduction to understand BIM and the construction industry from an innovation perspective. It's very important to understand the challenges of BIM diffusion within a at a whole market level. Uh, if we compare construction industry with any other sectors, uh, we, 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 we could, uh, all other sectors, they have done really a huge uh, uh, advancement in terms of processes, tools, and products. When we compare the construction industry uh, to any other sectors, uh, what do you reckon should be today? Is it? No, it's not here really. It's basically uh, a combination of some part are using the old ways, a, a big portion of the industry are still using old methods, and as well a, a, a good portion are using uh, the new methods, which we talked about the whole day. But the question is, why not everyone is on the right side? Like not, why not, if, if the benefits are so obvious, not everyone, why not everyone is on the right side? Like if, if you talk about smartphone, iPhone or any smartphone, it's obvious everyone has an iPhone. Why, for example, with BIM, not everyone is, is there? To, to answer this question, I don't have an exhaustive answer to this. I just from an innovation perspective, I want to define the construction industry and I want to define BIM. What, what I found strange today is that it's 4 p.m. and no one has defined BIM. <laughs> Usually in conferences, BIM gets defined 300 times. So I, I will start with the construction industry. I'll use here some slides, uh, some representation from Ralph. Uh, the construction industry is often classified as complex, dynamic, and loosely coupled. What we mean by complex? Complex means it's composed of many systems that could have uncontrollable dynamics. What that means? I'm talking like an academic now. <laughs> what that means? That means like uh, it, it, it's complex if you need to make change in one part that implies changes in many different parts. It's not like uh, it's not like just you change the small parts. And what, ma what makes co uh, construction complex is, it's not just usually in research or academics, they define complex project depending on the size, value, number of stakeholders. Really what makes construction in industry complex is the communication. You can see there the pattern of communication is very fuzzy and that's what makes it complex. So if we, if we, the other aspect of construction, it's an industry with very high turnover and low margin. And if both the definition and the characteristic of the construction industry, they both lead, leads us to the same thing, that it's industry with low rate of innovation. So we, on the one hand, we have the construction industry that, that looks like this. On the other hand, uh, I will define BIM, I will give you three definition of BIM. You haven't seen any today. So the first one is, uh, I think was defined implicitly today many times, it's about whole life cycle, it's about collaboration, it's about technology, process, and policies. What we mean by policies, new roles, new uh, contractual frameworks, and all that uh, stuff. Uh, the second definition, uh, BIM is the current expression of digital innovation, and that came clear from the different presentation today. All new services, new roles, new products are really the direct result of innovation. And why, why, why I say current? Because what's doing all that type of, all that kind of innovation within the construction industry is currently BIM. We don't know in 10 years what will happen, but currently BIM is doing that effect within the construction industry. But in terms of innovation, what innovation BIM is? That's very important. Uh, BIM is classified as a systematic or unbounded innovation. What, what that means? means that if you introduce a systematic innovation within a system, which is a construction industry, it entails changes, it entails like the introduction of uh, multiple innovations. It's not like the LED light, you just, the electric circuit is the same, you just change the bulb, 
Here, when you introduce BIM within the construction industry, you need to introduce multiple innovation at the same time. Uh, and it requires significant reshaping of, of the construction uh, system. So what, what we're trying to mix, you know, what we're trying to put in our salad, we're trying to have, on the one hand, we have construction industry, which is complex, dynamic, and loosely coupled. And on the other, uh, and on the other si uh, side, uh, the same part of the equation, we have BIM, which is a systematic innovation. So the result is adoption is quite challenging. It's like climbing mountain. So there'll be lots of casualties during uh, on the way. However, luckily we have we have some knowledge, you know, through research, through like big institution like CETA, BIM Task Group, that helps us really to understand adoption. Uh, another. Uh, element of introduction that I wanted to, uh, which I feel it's important that that was uh, alluded to in the presentation by Anne and uh, Dominic. Uh, how we get to be wise as human being? Usually we go through that process. We go through signal carrying data. We put the data into context. It becomes information. We connect different pools of information. It becomes knowledge. And then if we use knowledge to make choices, that gain approval in the long term by a large number of stakeholders, we usually make wise choices. So before BIM, we, had, we have a situation like this. We used to create some data. Not all of it used to be converted in information. We used to create some knowledge. We are not good at knowledge management in, in construction. And we didn't use to create lots of wisdom. With BIM, that improved. We create much more information. Uh, we are able to uh, put into context more of it. So we convert more into information and more into knowledge and more into wisdom. The, the future BIM, or I call it post-BIM, uh, it's going even to really uh, change this process significantly. We're going to see lots of data from the whole built environment, not only from the BIM software. We're going to see lots of, we will have capabilities of converting lots of data into uh, information and more data and knowledge and more data. So basically, this emergent process of creating wisdom will be radically affected. Uh, it's being radically affected through BIM and will be more radically affected in future. So that's in terms of introduction to understand, uh, to understand uh, BIM from an innovation perspective. Let's move on to the first uh, part, uh, to, to the second and last part, really. It's about BIM at market-wide level. Uh, I have to acknowledge here the contribution of my colleague, Bilal Sukkar. He's an uh, opinion leader in BIM. I've been working on, with him on this area since about five years. Uh, what we realized five years ago when we started this research, uh, we, 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 we found two gaps on the market, despite like there are lots of con uh, countries developing BIM policies. There wasn't any decision model that helps uh, decision maker or guides a decision maker on how to develop policies. That's the first driver. And the second driver, there was no data to benchmark. Uh, and that was it's a great initiative, Alan. So we, we, we wanted to address those two challenges. To, do, to address those two challenges, we developed five models. I'll, I'll start, as, I'll go through the five models one by one. I will start with the second one, which is, uh, we call it macro maturity model. Uh, and as part of when I show the models, I'll show the result of a survey, international survey we did with uh, 21 countries. We applied those five models across 21 countries. I'll show the results. So I'll be, you, we will go through one model, result, one model, result, until we finish. The first model is uh, the macro maturity component models. Basically, this model says simply, any market uh, should have eight maturity topics should reach eight uh, maturity uh, across eight topics. These eight topics are the first one, objectives, stages, and milestone. Uh, and with this, we refer to the availability of market-wide BIM objectives, like in the UK, level two, level three. Uh, the second component, champions and drivers. Uh, we, champions and drivers could be individual, could be organizations, uh, a championing or uh, 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 encouraging the adoption of BIM within a market. The difference between champions and driver, champion is volunteer, driver is someone with a mandate. Tradition typically is a top-down mandate. The third component, regulatory framework. We know that BIM workflow needs some, uh, need to, some new uh, IPR liability clauses. So with this component, we refer how the market is responding to those needs. Uh, Notwithstanding publication, this is a big component where under which we have all 
like standards, um, guides, uh, protocols available at market-wide level. Learning and education, we refer to the market-wide educational activities by uh, tertiary education, higher education, and private education that are available at market-wide level for learners within a country. Measurement and benchmark, we refer to all, uh, measure, all kind of metrics available within the country to measure individual projects or teams or organizations. Standardized part and deliverables, we refer to anything that's standardized at industry-wide level. Could be product data template, could be a protocol template, could be BIM objects. And technology infrastructure, this is a broad component referring to uh, network, uh, uh, hardware, and software. So how we measure those uh, components? We have two kind of uh, measurements. The first one is uh, for every, for each uh, is a component of the, uh, for each component we have a metric. The metric could be high level metric. In this case, I'm showing the high level metric, for example, for the objective stages and milestone, going from A, low maturity, there are no objective on the market. Uh, B, they are, they are objectives and they are well-defined and they have capability stages and we go on and on until reaching uh, the highest maturity E. Same for chemis and driver, basically all our metrics goes from not available lowest maturity up to the highest where they are optimized and reflected across the seven other seven components. The same for the regulatory framework, we have for example low maturity if there isn't any formal BIM specific reg regulatory framework and uh, we go up to E, the highest maturity, where uh, the regulatory framework is continuously updated to reflect changes in technology, uh, in technology and uh, collaboration uh, workflows. So we, we send those, uh, what we do with this model is we do two things. One, we assess the maturity of market, and the second thing is we help policymakers develop BIM roadmap, and I'll show you examples. First, let's go through the result of assessing 21 countries through this model. Uh, we assessed 21 countries, which you see there, including Ireland, uh, and we had about 99 experts. It took us about five months, lots of chasing emails to get uh, 99 answers, but they were all top experts. Like, uh, in every country, we selected really the top, top experts, like uh, in the US, for example, people the like of John Messner, same in Canada. And we asked them to rate their, those eight components across their country. And this is the result we got. Uh, this, this one is showing uh, the, each color is one of the components. What we can see from this result, it's uh, in terms of cumulative prob probability, if I add the score across the eight components, the UK has achieved the highest score. Uh, other countries uh, followed by the Netherlands, China, uh, Ireland somehow we, it came in the middle, in the middle of uh, of the ranking. However, if we if we take another view of those results, uh, we color code them uh, uh, orange from uh, from white cell up to dark orange, highest score. What you realize is this: there isn't one single country leading across all components. So some, for example, the UK is the country with, which, is, uh, which is leading across the highest number of components, which is five. If you look at Ireland, uh, it's, it's leading in education, BIM education. It, it's the it's highest score in BIM education across all 21 countries. So what, what, this model basically is telling us if we need to use this model to lear for learning, we could look, for example, at the country who has achieved the highest score, for example, in component uh, one, which is objective stages and milestone. Uh, which is the UK, and then we could go and learn from the UK. So you can see we don't do the assessment to create just a world league. We do it to create, to promote learning from one country to another. Moving on to uh, developing a uh, BIM roadmap. Over the last few years, I have seen lots of roadmaps. Often they have this problem. Uh, they have either missing components or they are un unclear or they have redundant components. So what I do to develop a a very well coordinated roadmap. These are my eight areas of maturity. I split them, I put them across a timeline, and I start assigning uh, policy deliverable across each of the components. For example, for the objectives, I can start with basic objective, then I can start with more specific objective for each project type, and, and so on. 
and you do this for every you do this for every uh, component out of the eight, and you get really a very well coordinated roadmap. The roadmap you get from applying this model, it's it doesn't have duplication, it doesn't have gaps because all those models are uh, very represent very well the reality. They've been tested, they've been uh, challenged as well. I will I will challenge some some of the models with you later on. Uh, so. So this basically helped us in really developing. And we are using this model with many countries like Spain, uh, has been used in Chile, in Brazil, it's being used in Canada, now Alan is using it. So it's being used by in many countries to guide the development of roadmap. <coughs> Moving on to model two. Model two is uh, is a little bit uh, more complex than the others. Basically we have we have we have what we say, we have nine area of diffusion. Instead of saying, instead of measuring BIM within country as 65% of using BIM, what that means? You know, really lots of surveys over the last few years, uh, 70 using BIM, 75, that doesn't mean anything. So what we did, we have two things. One is we, we have three BIM capability, which are modeling, collaboration, and integration. And we have the three part of BIM, which are, which are policy, technology, and process. If we cross them, you have nine areas of diffusion. So we use this model basically to understand the extent of where is the industry in terms of is it, is it still at the modeling stage or, or at the collaboration or integration. And we can have a feeling from applying this model if the market is just focused on technology or they are considering as well the process and policy aspects. And we applied this model across the 21 countries and we got, uh, we got this result. Some countries, they have a good distribution, uh, a balanced distribution across the nine areas. Other countries, they have like some areas of diffusion uh, missed, like uh, you can see like Switzerland, they have just two out of the nine areas. If you want to develop a BIM policy for a country who has just two of, out of the nine area, that your starting point is more challenging. While if you start with a market where you have already capabilities across the nine areas, it's much easier. Uh, so some interesting finding from applying that model across all markets, we found that the majority of the market, is, there is a trend, uh, there is a concentration of modeling followed by uh, collaboration, followed by integration. And this is quite interesting because it, it's, uh, Despite we all know those are the three capability stages of BIM, modeling, collaboration, integration, but it has never been demonstrated theoretically that all countries follow that trend. So that's an interesting finding, finding across all countries. Uh, the third model called the fusion dynamic model. This is an interesting model. Basically, it explains how BIM diffuses within a market and it identifies three dynamics. The first one you all heard of is top down. Top down one is a, like the uh, government in the UK level two BIM is mandated to everyone within its uh, its like uh, uh, the government rank, and the the top down can diffuse as well horizontally, not just down could go diffuse diffuse to other countries, and the bottom up the bottom up up when you have in a country you have lots of small organization engineering firms small design uh, architectural firms applying it and influencing bigger firms, large sized firm to adopt it. Uh, but the interesting dynamic which hasn't been identified before is the middle out. Middle out basically, it's when large organization, large contracting or client organization or uh, engineering firms adopt BIM internally and push it downward to the supply chain or start lobby government, governmental institute on top uh, to adopt BIM. When we applied this model in 21 countries, lots of countries, uh, they experienced this. Everything start, some countries experienced this. Uh, at the beginning, lots of small firms adopted it. They influenced medium, uh, large firm, who then influenced government or regional authority. So these are the result. Is it, what is, is interesting about this result is, uh, in most countries, uh, the diffusion dynamic is middle out. Middle out means, uh, as, I ex as I just mentioned, large firms are influencing uh, smaller firms, and they are a little bit as well uh, diffusing BIM upward to regional authority or government body. Uh, 
Uh, however, this dynamic is time dependent. Like if you apply it in, in six time, you find things might have changed. When we applied this, for example, in Spain, they said it's middle out. Basically, it's large firm are lobbying the government to, ad to mandate them or uh, adopt them. Uh, while at the beginning, it started really with small firms. And it, it's interesting to see how, 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 dyna how dynamics changes over time. The fourth model uh, is basically responding to this uh, need. What a policymaker can do to adopt or promote them? And there are three main activities, which are engage, monitor, and uh, engage, monitor, and uh, uh, sorry, communicate, engage, and monitor. The way the government can do those three activities, uh, they, ca uh, they can do them in three ways. One is uh, passive, one is active, one is assertive. What's the difference between the three? If I take a passive communication, passive communication basically is the government saying to the industry, look, there is something called BIM, why don't you adopt it? It's really useful for your, uh, uh, th that's a passive communication, like the EU uh, procurement directive. Uh, an active communication by the government, it's basically the government takes a role uh, of developing uh, directly or through association informative guide, guidelines for, uh, for the industry. Uh, assertive communication when the government say, this is what BIM means to me, this are, this are the system and workflow you have to use. And we have the same thing for engagement. You can engage just by, uh, by incentivizing or you can even uh, go up to uh, uh, enforcing. So uh, there are similar, uh, similar things for the monitoring. When we talked to the 21 countries, we assessed this in 21 countries, we found that the majority of countries, 14 out of 21, are still at the passive, uh, passive uh, or the, the approach for communication, engagement, and monitoring was fully passive. That doesn't mean they don't do anything. You know, the government's not doing anything in those countries. It's just it's doing something at the lowest possible intensity. In uh, five countries, we have uh, kind of active communication, education, basically, uh, uh, combined with uh, passive monitoring and uh, uh, such as basically engage and observe. In, in the Netherlands and UK, we have their, they have their own distinctive approach. In the Netherlands, uh, we have the pattern educate, incentivize, observe. In the UK, we have uh, uh, educate, enforce, and track, which was a unique, uh, unique, uh, unique pattern. Again, this changes over time. Uh, uh, changes over time. Uh, finally, the final model is uh, the macro diffusion responsibility. This is a very interesting model. Basically, this model is uh, classifying all player groups within the construction industry as nine player groups. And here I will challenge you if you could add a tenth one. So the nine players group are policymakers, educational institution, construction organization, people who are here, individual practitioner, you and me, uh, technology developer, Autodesk, uh, Archi, uh, Graphisoft, etc. cetera. Uh, technology service provider are like all those customization technology companies who add on top of what's off the shelf. Industry association like uh, RIBA, uh, CIOB, uh, community of practice like CETA, and technology advocates like Building Smart. Those are the nine stakeholders. We use this model to plan their role within the BIM uh, uh, adoption, uh, uh, BIM adoption, uh, macro adoption. Uh, we use, we use, we could use this model to assess their contribution or plan their contribution. So, can anyone? Uh, is there any category missed? Clients are like part of the construction, basically, construction. Uh, there, there is actually one missed. Uh, uh, there is someone who sits there in between the three circles in the middle, uh, which is the change agent. So you, uh, basically, in the UK, would be the BIM task group. OK, so that's, uh, th that's the only one missed, is the change agent who coordinates the whole effort on behalf of uh, within that market. Okay, so when we compare the role of those nine stakeholders across the 21 countries, this is what we got. Uh, if we take technology developers like software companies apart, there isn't any player dominating uh, uh, the activities of uh, encouraging ma uh, 
microbiome adoption at market-wide level. In the UK, we have, uh, for example, uh, a, a strong role of the policy uh, policymaker uh, through the UK BIM Task Group. What's interesting from the application of this model, you can really identify gaps. You can identify countries where there are certain stakeholders who are not giving participating to uh, to the policy development effort. So it's very important when you when you plan the roles of different stakeholders to to learn from different countries where certain stakeholders has uh, a, high, a high contribution. So in terms of, uh, I'm actually finishing uh, before time, I have just one slide for conclusion. Basically, applying those models is what, what they help us to do. They help us really to minimize duplication, identify policy gaps, improve clarity and coordination because we can develop roadmaps which are very clear, and they encourage engagement. When you have a clear roadmap, which doesn't have diffusion gaps, it shows the contribution of the different stakeholders. You are very high, it's very highly likely that people will engage with your roadmap. Finally, which is the most important point, uh, they promote learning across countries and reduce effort of uh, policy development. So just uh, uh, to add what we are trying to do, uh, we did this study, we compared and benchmarked, it's a huge effort to, of doing 21 countries. Uh, we actually, this is the first time I present this in a conference. There is a peer review paper, which is currently under review. Uh, we wanted to write a book chapter similar to the effort, uh, uh, sorry, a book similar to the effort Alan and uh, the CETA are doing. And we contacted top academics from the US to join us in this initiative. And then they suggested that uh, instead of really writing a book uh, that will require high maintenance because policy is being developed every month, every year, what, what we need really is to develop, use your model to develop a BIM policy development guide, a BIM policy development guide for countries. You know, like the Penn State kind process map, we need to do something similar for policy makers to develop BIM policies. And we took that idea on board and we are currently have something called BIM Excellence Initiative. It's an open research in initiative. Any, anyone can join it. Uh, so currently this project is being, uh, the development of BIM policy guide is an undergoing project under the BIM Excellence Initiative. Thank you very much.